Good evening and welcome to Monobiology. Tonight we're going to be talking about mitosis. And before we get started, we're just going to talk about a couple of the reasons why mitosis is important and why we learn about it. The unit we're studying currently is called reproduction and development. There would be no development if there was no mitosis. And many types of reproduction would not occur without mitosis either. Let's give a couple examples. For starters, every one of us grows when we develop. Take a look at the picture here. We have a kitten, and over here we have a cat. That wouldn't happen without mitosis. And here we have a series of red blood cells, and over here we have a greater series of red blood cells. This can be used to represent something that might happen if somebody was, if an athlete was training at high altitudes, you might start off with this many red blood cells and you might move to this many red blood cells. That would happen because there's less oxygen at the high altitudes, so your body compensates by making more red blood cells. Your body wouldn't be able to make more red blood cells if it wasn't for mitosis. Here we have one of the most important forms of mitosis, at least for bacteria. Take a look right here in this area. This cell here has just completed asexual reproduction, a form of mitosis known as binary fission. And this is how arguably the most successful organisms, bacteria, reproduce. So mitosis is pretty important. Next we're going to go through Next, we're going to go through the phases of mitosis, and we're going to learn a little bit more about the phases of mitosis. As you've probably already learned, the, step, the first step of mitosis is called prophase. There, prophase has certain characteristics that you should make note of. First of all, notice that the centriole pairs have divided and are starting to move towards opposite sides or opposite poles of the cell. And also notice that the centriole pairs have started forming what we call spindle fibers. And those spindle fibers are eventually going to be important in the mitotic process. Also, the nucleus that was once fully formed around the chromosomes is starting to dissolve. You can see the holes poked in around the, around the nucleus here. That's a good sign that you're in prophase. Also, the chromosomes, which really aren't visible any other time other than during mitosis, have become visible. And you can see that each chromosome is a double. It's like an X. And in the center of the chromosomes, we have things called centromeres. So again, just to repeat, there's two main, three main parts to prophase that you can recognize prophase. The centrioles have divided and are starting to move towards opposite poles. The spindle fibers have started to form and the nucleus is reforming. And of course, you can see Sorry, the nucleus is not reforming. The nucleus is dissolving, and the chromosomes are visible. Those are the important things to remember about prophase. Step two of mitosis is called metaphase. It is probably the easiest phase to identify, simply because all of the chromosomes are lined up down the equator, the equatorial plate you'll sometimes see, but basically, they're lined up in the center of the cell. All of the chromosomes are lined up in the center of the cell. And that's why it's the e most easily identifiable phase. There's a couple other things that are, uh, that are recognizable in here, too. Notice also that the centriole pair that were kind of closer together in prophase are now at opposite ends, and the spindle fibers, notice, have grown and are actually attached to the centromeres. 
which of course wasn't noticeable in Proface. So again, there's three things that you can recognize here. First of all, probably most importantly, the chromosomes are lined up in the middle. The centriole pairs are now at opposite ends of the cell or poles of the cell, and the spindle fibers have now grown, and some are attached to the centromeres of the chromosomes. Step three is called anaphase. Anaphase involves the pulling apart of the chromosomes that were here at the equatorial plate in metaphase. As you can see, the chromosomes, which were once doubled, are now split in half. You can see them moving away from each other, like that. All right, so each chromosome has been split in half, and these little, air, these little parts here now are referred to as chromatids, sometimes sister chromatids. And this one and this one are identical, and this one and this one are identical, and this one and this one are identical, genetically speaking, because that's what's going to form the DNA of each new cell. Right? Uh, another thing to notice here during anaphase, not only are the chromosomes separating, but the spindle fibers are contracting. They're moving back towards the centriole pair. So the two major things you're going to notice about anaphase, the chromosomes split into sister chromatids, and the spindle fibers contract, moving the chromatids towards opposite poles of the cell. The final step of mitosis is called telophase. As you can see, here and here, the centriole pairs have completed the pulling of the chromosomes towards either end of the cell. The nucleus is starting now to reform. And notice there's two of them. One that will be in either of the new cells at the end of mitosis. The spindle fibers have contracted quite significantly. And what will eventually happen, going over to this picture now, is that the cytoplasm will begin to divide. This is called, this area right here of indentation, this pinching in is called cleavage. And this, that's happening right here where the cytoplasm is dividing evenly, as you can see, that is called cytokinesis, which is technically a separate part of uh, telophase. It's, it's not part of telophase, it's separate part all on its own, but we usually include it here because it happens immediately following this particular part right here. So the cytoplasm is going to split, and this is called cytokinesis. This little indentation here and here is called cleavage, and you can see that again the, centriol, the centrioles are kind of moving away from the chromosomes here and here, and again the nucleus is reforming and the chromosomes are going to, in fact, go back to their state of uh, being spread out, so they're no longer visible. So at the end of telophase, you will no longer be able to see these particular uh, chromosomes anymore. How much time does a cell spend dividing? Well, in truth, not very much time at all. Even the cells that divide a lot still spend less time in mitosis than they do in the, in the rest of the cell life called interphase. Let's take a look at this picture here. Uh, what you see here is a picture of a, a, a cross-section of cells, and you'll see that they're in various states of the cell cycle, which of course includes interphase. Right, so you can probably pick out um, several things in this picture that uh, kind of stand out to you. Um, obviously, you can see these ones here where you can see the chromosomes. You can see all these different ones where you can see the chromosomes. And then there's lots of ones where you can't see the chromosomes, like this one, this one, this one, this one. You get the idea. All right. To get an idea of how much time uh, a cell spends dividing, look at all the cells in here that are dividing and compare them to the ones that aren't dividing. Okay, so let's say 
let's pick all the ones that where we can the, the chromosomes are visible and we'll assume those ones are dividing and then all the ones where the chromosomes aren't visible those ones aren't dividing so we've got one two three four five six seven eight nine and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight cells that aren't dividing. Okay, so that gives us an idea of how long a cell would spend in in in, in mitosis which really isn't that much. In fact, this is actually a fairly big sample size um, of cells that are, in fact, dividing. And um, this would be not typical of cells, you know, typical cells in your body, like, uh, like liver cells, for instance. This would be atypical of those because liver cells don't divide that often at all. These might be more typical of skin cells. Right? So cells do not spend much time dividing. They spend time doing what they're supposed to do, whatever that is. They're skin cells, they're being skin cells. If they're liver cells, then they're doing liver cell stuff. But they really don't spend a lot of time dividing. The problem becomes if they do spend a lot of time dividing, then they're considered to be cancerous. And that is a discussion for another time.